In this module, we'll be discussing, or this lecture, we'll be discussing uh, the major sociological perspectives, which I've begun to outline behind me. Um, basically, a perspective is exactly that, a way of looking at something. Uh, there are many, many, many different ways of looking at the same issue. Uh, that is, of course, true in sociology as well. So we'll be looking at various ways of looking at the same topic. So the topic I'm going to use uh, to illustrate this point is, I think we can all agree, if we look at the statistics, that the rate of divorce in the United States has risen over time. Um, again, looking at the facts, looking at uh, the analysis has gone, we know this to be true, so what we're now going to do is attempt to explain that phenomena from three different points of view. Okay? The very first one we're going to be discussing uh, is symbolic interactionism. Now, as you can see up here, I've also written the words micro and macro and macro again. Um, the idea behind micro and macro sociology is, again, the focus of those particular perspectives. So when we're looking at things from a micro standpoint, we are looking at the smallest elements of society, and clearly when we look at it, something on the size of a society, the smallest elements are the individuals and their behaviors and interactions. So microsociology focuses on the very small elements of society. Clearly the opposite is true for macrosociology, which is going to focus on the large elements of society, large organizations, um, and we'll come to more definitions about that in a little bit. So when we take a look at the idea of why, has, why have divorce rates gone, up, uh, rates gone up in our culture, we could start with symbolic interactionism. The idea, and I have George Herbert Mead, is a great example of a symbolic interactionist. And when we come up with a definition, we're basically talking about interpreting the changing meaning of symbols in a society or a culture. symbol is anything that has some type of attached meaning to it. So if I were to show you a red octagon, or a picture thereof, um, you would automatically, even without the words being written on it, say to me, that's a stop sign. And I would say to you, how do you know that's a stop sign? And your most probable answer was, I don't know, I just know. And that is kind of the, what the definition of a symbol is. It's something that the majority of people in a culture agree has a specific meaning. For instance, if you saw that red octagon as you were driving and you drove right past it without coming to a stop and you were pulled over by a police officer and the police officer probably righteously would say, didn't you see that stop sign? And you might say, I saw that but I didn't know what it meant. Okay, that's probably not the explanation that would get you off the hook. The understanding is everybody who belongs to a particular culture is expected to understand the meanings of the symbols of that culture. Right? We'll talk much more about this in the second module when we discuss culture, but for right now that's a good uh, start for the understanding of what a symbol is. So symbolic interactionism is looking at the changing meanings of symbols in a society. When we look at symbolic interactionism to explain uh, why the divorce rate would be going up in our society, what we could say is, let's take a look at the symbols involved with it. Obviously, divorce is itself a symbol, but its opposite, marriage, is also a symbol. All right, so we can say, what do the marriage, uh, the symbols of marriage and divorce mean over different times in a society? Uh, so I'll just use as an example, let's say 50 or 60 years ago, from the 1950s, we'll talk about the definition of symbols of marriage and divorce, and then modern times, what are the symbols of marriage and divorce mean? Uh, if you're familiar with, like I said, the 1950s, uh, either from experiencing them yourself, or if uh, you watched movies, uh, television that talk about the 50s, and I were to say to you, what was marriage like in the 50s? Um, a lot of uh, 
words pop into mind. Uh, commitment, the idea that marriage was felt to be a permanent thing when people entered into. In other words, those ideas of uh, till death do us part were much more strong uh, when we associate uh, the, I, the, the concept of marriage. Um, marriage was very much an obligation, something that people were expected to do, uh, something that people were expected to engage in uh, if you're, as part of society. Um, we often talk about the idea by 18, it was pretty much expected that you either were going or were married or planning to be married uh, within a short period of time. Um, we also talk about the idea of very strong guidelines that existed at the time. So a young married couple uh, who might not know exactly how to go about being married would probably look around them and find that family, friends, neighbors, acquaintances uh, were areas that they could go to for just observation or actual feedback on this process of being married and how to quote unquote kind of stay married uh, through these things. So we see all these associations with the symbol of marriage at a particular time. If we take a look at divorce from again that rough period of time about the 1950s and I ask you what was it like to be divorced at that time, we'd probably come up with a bunch of other definitions, things like uh, you were considered in some way shamed in a lot of cases, uh, especially we look at gender roles here, uh, men were looked at as having abandoned their families. They were the ones who initiated the divorce. Uh, the idea of, you know, kind of running away from your responsibilities for women. Divorce was uh, unfortunately also uh, in a lot of ways uh, considered very shameful in a sense of somehow they failed at being a, a, a good or a, or a proper wife. Um, so we have all these issues of shame, ideas of stigma. Um, generally divorce was rather considered immoral, okay, uh, that, you know, the shame and associated with it, um, again, a lot of uh, religious beliefs at the time that prohibited uh, divorce except under very strict circumstances, uh, so you had these overall symbolic, symbolic images in society of what it meant to be divorced. So if we look at that and we realize how strong the symbols were for marriage and how strong the symbols were for divorce, we could make an assumption that the divorce rate during that period of time would probably be rather low. Then we look at, conversely, modern times. What does the modern definition or symbol of marriage mean? And if we look around, we can clearly see uh, evidence that the modern symbol now takes on much more uh, different meaning than the one we discussed earlier. Uh, we could say that marriage today, to a certain degree, could be considered to be uh, much more temporary. Again, definitely point to the rise of the, the increasing uh, practice of prenuptial agreements. The idea of we're going to go into this with the assumption that it may or probably will not work and when that happens we will have a pre-planned uh, idea of what's going to happen to our assets and children and all these other kind of things. So we clearly see that marriage takes on kind of a much more idea of being temporary. Uh, clearly it's taken on a different role when it comes to that idea of being an obligation. Marriage is often looked at as something that's much more of uh, something that people do based on attraction rather than the need to do. Um, that people are often told, again I mentioned before in the 1950s, at 18 the expectation was you should be married. Uh, clearly in our society today most 18 year olds are probably given the advice, wait, you're not ready yet. Okay, so put that off, get other things done in your life first, uh, find somebody that you truly care about, again, based on mutual attraction, um, and the symbol of divorce has clearly taken on different meanings. We look at the idea of um, divorce sometimes being liberated, that idea of a new beginning, uh, that the, the stigma that was once associated with it is no longer there. Um, you know, much more common in today's society than meeting a new person to find out within a very short period of time uh, as part of their description of who they are or what their status is in society to find out that they're divorced and the reaction is clearly much different than it used to be. So we look at these changing symbols of marriage and divorce over time and the explanation that the changing meanings of symbols uh, gives us is clearly one that describes very uh, accurately why the divorce rate is gone, okay? 
The second one I put up here is much more of a macro theory. In other words, we're looking at the larger elements of society. This is uh, a theory that was um, made prominent by uh, people such as Robert Merton and Talcott Parsons, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, the idea of functionalism. Functionalism is the idea that society is very much like a living organism. So if you think about the human body as an organism, the human body is made up of different systems that work together. And each of those systems is made up of different parts. So I could say to you there's the circulatory system made up of hearts and blood vessels, the heart and blood vessels. Uh, if I could say the pulmonary system, the lungs and the ways that they regenerate uh, or uh, re-aerate the blood. Uh, the nervous system, which is made of the spine, the spinal column, and all the peripheral nerve systems, uh, the muscular and skeletal system. So all these systems work together to create the greater whole. Uh, that's the idea of functionalism, that society is made up of all sorts of different aspects. So you have things like the economy, and politics, and the media, and education, and health care. And each of these things, just like organs in a body, all work together to create the greater whole that we call society. All right. So uh, we can write that down. Society is like a living organism. All the parts working together. And two of the things that we can look at. <clears throat> when we look at the idea of these various parts working together is what is the structure of the thing that you're looking at and what is its function. In other words, how does it fit into the greater whole and what does it do? So if I were to again hold up a human heart and say, what is this? You might say to me, that's a heart. And I would say, where does it fit in the human body? And you tell me what system it's part of and then what's its function? What does it do? It pumps blood. Okay, so it's part of the circulatory system and it pumps blood would be its structure and function. So again, going back to some of the examples I used earlier, I could say to you, education. What is education? Its function is to pass on information, and its structure would be its relationship that it has to all the other parts of society. Right? So in relation now to our question about why is the divorce rate going up, and we're looking at it from a functional point of view, what we should do is take a look at the function and the structure of one of those aspects of society that we associate most with the idea of marriage, and that is the family. The family is a social institution uh, that provides, again, much of the uh, very important uh, job in, in society, much as an organ provides a job. When we take a look at how the American family has changed over time in its structure and function, we could take a look at earlier society. We could go back to, let's say, even say, <clears throat> excuse me, colonial times, and take a look at what was the structure and function of the family in the American society. <coughs> uh, clearly we know that the society worked very much as a economic unit. Okay? Everybody in the job, everybody in the, in the uh, family had a job and contributed to the overall success of the family. And then those families contributed to the overall success of society. So going back to the living organism, it's just like uh, people have jobs to do, and they do them, and then that contributes to the larger whole. So when we look at the American family, we clearly see that the family was a tight economic unit. Uh, males and females, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, adults and children, each had a role in participating in the success of the family structure, the family economic unit. When we look at the modern family, has the structure and function of the American family changed? We clearly see that it has. When we look at that idea of the family unit being a tight economic unit, that really doesn't apply to the majority of families in society today. We clearly see that there's many more outside influences, many of the jobs and responsibilities that were once accomplished within the family are now, in a sense you could use the term, outsourced to other things. So we see the influence of the educational system. Uh, we can see the influence on other social forces that now perform many of the functions that the American family used to do. So we can in fact say that the structure and function of the American family has changed to the point where 
it no longer performs the same tasks and is now providing uh, a lot of those <clears throat> functions are being picked up by other parts of society, uh, which means that then, again, the family has changed in its function and divorce rates would, would be explained that way. The very last one I wanted to talk about was, again, another macro, so we're looking at the larger elements of society here. Uh, we already discussed uh, Karl Marx and his uh, uh, introduction of conflict theory. So when we talk about conflict theory, we're basically saying that society is comprised of groups that compete with each other for what we call limited resources. resources. Anything that is necessary for you to be successful in society can be considered a resource. So again, things like money and power, um, all these things together are the things that people use to be successful. So those are resources. Uh, when we say that there's limited resources, what we basically are meaning is that there's only so much to go around and not everyone, according to conflict theory, is going to get the same amount. So when you're formed into groups, you will then need to compete with other people for those resources. Um, also, within conflict theory is the <clears throat> embedded notion of the struggle for authority. Who is going to be in charge? With the basic assumption being made that if you were in charge and society is about competing for resources, those people in charge are necessarily going to take more for themselves in this competition. Um, so when we talk about this in relationship to marriage and divorce, we can talk about the conflict between the two major groups that comprise most marriages. Uh, again, traditionally, it's not to say that this applies to all, but if we look at the roles of males and females in society, then we look at how they each compete for resources. In an earlier society, and if we're looking at the change over time, we go back to the earlier uh, notions, in a male-dominated or patriarchal society, then men were largely in control of resources. Women's access to resources were largely limited and their best means of gaining access to resources would have been by attaching themselves to males who have access to those resources. So in other words, uh, growing up in society, it would start with uh, your father, but then later in life, through marriage, you would have access to the resources of society. <clears throat> later in so then in, uh, in society, as society has progressed, I should say, uh, we see now that women have much more access to resources on their own. So they're much more available or availing of the resources of society through being able to uh, increase their rates of education and uh, careers. So with the, according to conflict theory, uh, now that women have more access to resources independent of their attachment to males, they, in some ways, regard that attachment as being no longer necessary and in some cases even undesirable to their goal of competing for resources. So from a conflict theory point of view, the explanation for the rise in divorce rates is the basically the rules of competition have changed. 